This video was produced as a response to a viewer's request for an explanation of how the particular solution to the second order differential equation that resulted from a small perturbation to the relativistic orbit equation was produced in the video entitled Schwarzschild Geodesics number 5. So the fifth in the Schwarzschild Geodesic series. So this is a special request for that person. And just going back over the basics from that video, um, Schwarzschild Geodesics number 5, we looked at how light uh, inbound towards a Schwarzschild mass, but with an impact parameter B, so off center from the uh, center of the Schwarzschild mass, but with impact parameter B here. And we found that these light paths here could be described, these straight line light paths here could be described by this equation here. And uh, Schwarzschild mass here, and we have the position, the distance from the center of Schwarzschild mass is R, and we have the angle phi here, and it was we have a relationship between R and phi in the form of this straight line here. Now the equation that governs the shape of orbits in general is this, from that uh, from that particular video. This is what we found. And we found the solution for light rays with impact parameter B to be the straight lines given by this value here, U, the solution U, is sine phi on B. Now this is the homogeneous solution to this part of it, the homogeneous solution. We found this worked. Our next step was then to add a small perturbation to this in the form that U, the general solution U, becomes the homogeneous solution, U subscript H, this part, plus a perturbation. Now we substitute this into our orbit equation, and when we did that, we ended up with this, second derivative of this part here, plus this bit plus that, <coughs> is equal to this bit over here. Remember there was a u squared here, so that. let's expand that out. Well, when we do the uh, second derivative of this bit here, we're going to have minus sine phi on b, and over here we have a plus sine phi and b, so those two are going to cancel out, disappear. We're left with a second derivative of the perturbation term, plus the perturbation, and then this expansion over here on the right. Now to first order, so, we, so delta u is a small perturbation, so square that, that gets even smaller more rapidly, so we can drop that off. So to first order, we have this bit here, so this bit here down here. Right now, the second term on the right can disappear because it is also very small. So we have here um, delta u times this is very small in relation to this first term here. So this term here will be very small due to the delta u being a small perturbation uh, compared to this term here. So we can drop that out. So the second term on the right can disappear. It's also very small. And we're left with this equation here, second order differential equation, linear differential equation. All right, next bit. We can just use a trigonometric identity to rewrite the right-hand side. So this sine squared term can be replaced with this trig identity here. And just a little bit of tidying that up, we can end up with this object here. All right, using the method of undetermined coefficients, we now seek a particular solution. And the uh, we found a solution for the homogeneous part, that was the sine phi on B. And now we seek, because this is a non-homogeneous second order differential equation, because there's a non-zero term on the right here, and so we seek a particular solution. And our final solution will be made up of the homogeneous part and the particular part, and that will be our total solution. So the particular part, we have some trigonometric terms here and a constant, so we seek something general form for, for this. Uh, would be expanded in terms of a sine 2 phi and a cos 2 phi because of the trig term here, and plus we have this constant term on the end. So the general form is something along this line here. And we're going to use the method of undetermined coefficients, A and B. We're going to find out what they are. All right, so the first derivative of the particular solution is this object here. The second derivative is then this object here. We now substitute into our equation. Remember, on the left we had this. And when we substitute in, we're going to get all of this. Let's substitute in the particular solution plus the second derivative, which is bit here. When we do that, tidy it up, we'll have this minus 3a sine 2 phi minus 3b cos 2 phi plus a constant term on the end. And what we can then do is 
that we know will be equal to the original equation because remember this bit on the left here was equal to this bit that was the whole non-homogeneous second order differential equation so this second last line here this one must be equal to that and when we solve for a and b we find that 3a must be zero because there's no sign term in here so a must be zero and when we equate minus 3b cos 2 phi with minus 3gm on equating coefficients minus 3b is equal to minus this and we find that b is 2gm on 2c squared b squared so the particular solution is remember it was b cos 2 phi plus this so we found b we put that in there like that I'll just rearrange it a little bit I'll put the constant first and the cos 2 phi term second and I'll also put in a one third term there which means I can add a three up here so there was no three here before but if I put a one third term in front of the cos 2 phi we, we can then put a three up there and what that then means is that this and this can be factored out so we have 3gm on 2c squared b squared times this cos term here and that was the question and the whole point of this video is how did I come up with this? Uh, the viewer or viewers actually wanted uh, an explanation of how this happened for the particular solution. So the complete solution then is this. We found earlier sine phi on B plus this business here. And just reminding ourselves here's the complete solution again. Now what we wanted to do was to find an approximation because we wanted to relate the change in angle as the photon or light wave passed the Schwarzschild mass by how much was it deflected. This We're after this change in the angle phi that caused the deflection. <clears throat> now we can do that as what we can do is then set um, u equal to, to zero as r approaches infinity we can set u to zero because if you remember in that video u was equal to one on r or r was one on u so as r approaches infinity u approaches zero and for small angles sine phi is approximately five for say from about zero to five degrees or so sine phi is approximately the phi and cos phi for small angles phi is approximately cos two phi is approximately one so where the u is let's put zero all right uh, where the cos 2 phi is approximately one we'll put one third times one is one third and sine phi is approximately phi so we'll put phi over b now a little bit of algebra solving for that if you you got one plus a third here well that's four over three the three and the three cancel out you get four over two which is just two so we're left with two gm on c squared b squared and if we take this over the other side we get phi on b is minus 2gm on c squared b squared not that the sign will be terribly important over here phi on b is uh, this object here which is just a repeat of the above line sorry about that uh, and if we multiply through by b we'll have phi by itself is minus 2gm on c squared b we've lost a factor of b here and next bit over just from our earlier diagram now we wanted to find as light is curved or bent around it's deflected from its original path here's the incoming photon here and due to the Schwarzschild mass and the curvature of the space-time around it it curves that and by how much is this original light beam deflected from its path okay well <clears throat> and that was the original question in geodesics number five the original video which sparked this okay now we can just do a little rearranging our diagram from before we have phi, we have r, but this time now, just rearranging, we're going to have this is delta phi on 2 because of the symmetry on both sides here, delta phi on 2, so we can find it on one side we, and then double it, we can find the total deflection that this light wave experiences, this photon experiences from its original path by how much delta phi is it deflected. So we have delta phi on 2 is 2gm on c squared b. Remember on the previous page we had phi here, it was minus 2gm minus c squared b. Now notice the minus doesn't matter, we're not concerned about direction in which the deflection is, we just want the quantity, how much. And we want to relate that deflection, of course, to the impact parameter and the mass, the Schwarzschild mass itself. 
So from this diagram here, highly symmetrical, delta phi on two, delta phi on two, delta phi on two is this object here, multiplying through by two, we have delta phi is four gm on c squared b. And this tells us that the amount of deflection, at least for small angles anyway, I mean, this is a very exaggerated diagram here, but for small angles, yeah, it, it, just coming back to this point, it is a very exaggerated diagram. This is, this is uh, what, what's this, this change here? It looks like it's more than 90 degree change. It's a very big change in the angle, but for smaller uh, deflections, this would be more appropriate. Delta phi is 4gm on c squared b. Okay, so the, the amount of deflection is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the um, impact parameter. And then finally, the angle of deflection experienced by the light as it passes the mass is just to conclude this business here. Now for large deflections, such as really in this diagram here, for large deflections, you need to have a look at the um, original video, Schwarzschild Geodesics 5, the fifth in that series. And it will, at, in the last page or so, it will give you the approach for a large deflections of angles. But just for small deflections, um, you know, for, for small deflections, you could use this result here.